welcome to the Transformed Man Show, the podcast for every man's journey to better health and fitness. And here is your host, Mr. Sean Nicholas. In today's episode, leading into Men's Health Week, we're discussing everything to do with men's health with Associate Professor Gary Richardson. Gary is a leading oncologist and also chairman of Foundation 49, a foundation set up to focus on men's health issues and develop strategies and advocacy for promoting men's health. Gary and I get into the nitty gritty of men's health, what the killers are, the the killers of men these days, and what we can do to prevent chronic illness and many of the health issues that are plaguing men in today's society. This is a really important episode. Uh, We hope you really enjoy it and really take away some valuable information. And if you're a man listening, hopefully it it inspires you to take some action and really look at your health, uh, go get a checkup and understand that you can do something to improve your health and you can help others improve their health. I really hope you get something out of this episode and if you do, don't forget to share it with others. Enjoy. Gary, welcome to the show. G'day, thanks for having me. Um, Gary, what I want to start with is, is something that will probably shock uh, many men out there and, and many people, but I think it's a fact that uh, people have to understand, and that is that every hour, four men in, in Australia die from potentially preventable, preventable conditions. Now, as an oncologist, you deal with four of the top 10 killers of, of men, which are cancers. Do, you look at, do we look at death from cancers as a preventable condition? I think a significant amount of cancer is preventable, not all of it. If you look at the potential causes of cancer, you would say that about 30% of causes are from what you inherit from your parents, your genes, you can't do much about that. But 70% is due to other factors and largely factors that involve uh, improvement with prevention and that is around things like smoking, things like uh, alcohol intake, uh, diet and certain types of lifestyle like lack of exercise. Yeah. I think I think as I think that's a great lead into to what um, how to we can prevent in those conditions. At what age at what age is it a case for men that they should be concentrating on being aware and, and alert of their health and the, the conditions that they may that may cause ill health? I think a lot earlier than most people think. I think if you don't make choices in your 20s, you'll regret them in your 40s and 50s. And things like smoking, for example, the lag time between when you smoke and when you develop cancer is often 20 to 30 years. So the biggest frustration for me is that I see a lot of men come in and say to me, but doc, I gave up smoking 10 years ago. And it's not those 10 years that saved them, it was the 20 more, 20 before that that caused the cancer. Another example of this is uh, exposure to the sun. It's been shown really that exposure to the sun as a child and a young adult is probably the most important time that sets you up for developing skin cancer at a much later age. So you re- we really have to have the message going all the way through about good health behaviours. Yes, and, and it's something that we, we really need as, as men, we need to pass on to our, our next generation. For many men listening uh, to this 
podcast that they'll probably be heading into their late thirties and forties at that age, apart from take out what they've done in their younger age, but what other health issues and health risks do they sort of crop up as you're coming into your forties and fifties? So you start to get encroachment from the common health issues that affect men, which are cardiovascular disease, and that really consists of heart problems, uh, stroke and diabetes, and certainly the last problem is becoming increasingly uh, prevalent in Australia. Then cancer, and once again the incidence of cancer increases the older you get, and so from that point of view, um, there are certain screening tests that if they don't get put in place at that point in time, should be put in place later. Men need to talk to their doctors about their family history because that may predispose them to conditions where they need to be screened much earlier than they otherwise would. So they may miss the boat in terms of their screening because of certain genes that they've inherited from their from their um, uh, parents. And then there's the other whole issue of mental health and the issue around how men deal with their place in the world. They deal with their place within their family, their, their place in the workplace, their place with their friends, all of those kind of things. And depression is a significant issue in Australia. And as we well know, suicide is a major problem, particularly among men, and more than 2,000 men per year will commit suicide. A lot of that could be prevented if the issues around their mental health could be dealt with at an earlier stage. So when you go to the doctor, you don't just want to say, gee, I've got a pain in my left foot. It's the doctor should really be asking you how are things going and, uh, you know, are there any signs that this person may be struggling and are there things that we could do to help them? And that's a great point. And is apart from the doctor, is it something we as men should be looking out for our mates and seeing how they are? And I know when we talk to our mates, we put on a brave face and, you know, we, we take all the burdens of the world on us. But as, as mates, should we be asking some harder questions to our, our friends and colleagues? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. I, I, I think on the whole, a lot of blokes don't like talking about emotional issues, but that's a generalisation. Some, some don't. But I think with your good friends, you know, you should take time to just ask them how they are going. I mean, everyone has periods where they struggle in life. It might be financial, it might be marital, it might be something else. And so from that point of view, you know, just really to ask your mate, how they're going, and, and I guess the other thing is that is is um, sometimes difficult for a lot of people to deal with is the fact that they may have something, they may have developed cancer or developed an illness or been found to have depression, and they've dropped out a bit of their social network. Those it's times like that when people need to say, "Look, mate, I'm here for you," you know. Uh, and people often don't know what to do, so they avoid it and they do nothing. And it's not so much they don't care, but they don't know how to cope with it. And so rather than deal with it, they avoid it. And I think if suddenly one of your mates doesn't turn up to an event they used to turn up to every week, you find out why. You go and you know, call them up, ask them why, work out what's going on, ask them out and have a talk to them, those sort of things. So you have to pick up on things a little bit more and you have to be a little bit more proactive. Yeah, and, and dig deeper in, in those conversations. I mean, if, if they're a true mate, you, you, want, you want the best for them, so dig deep and, and help them out. Now, um, you mentioned there... Um, talking about guys sort of being aware and coming to terms with, say, a condition, be it cancer or, or another health condition. Do you find that, that once the guys allow themselves to share that with their friends and their family, you can then, as a doctor, treat them better rather than them holding it in? Is, is that a factor in, in treatment? I think I think it helps. I think that uh, any treatment of any condition really comes down to 
a number of different areas. So it's not just the drug you use for the disease or whatever, but it is their mental outlook and their approach. I mean, there are issues around cancer that have become increasingly important over the last four or five years. For example, it's been shown that people that exercise while on treatment do better, not just have less side effects, have less fatigue, but they have less chance of their cancer coming back. You don't feel like exercising while you're on chemotherapy, let me tell you now, but the reality is that if you can give them a program and they stick to it, it also helps them mentally. If you can't keep them up mentally, they don't want to do anything. You know, they they just sort of fall into a a shell and uh, it's very hard to get them to do anything. You have to be proactive and uh, and help your doctor and your medical team. Uh, and the best way to do that is is to be honest and open and to make sure that you deal with the issues as you go along. Don't just bottle them all up and uh, and sort of spiral down mentally. Yeah, again, again that comes back to a theme of, of guys opening up and talking and expressing like emotionally and, and uh, with their families and, and with their friends to, to allow that to happen. Now, you, you mentioned before um, some screenings and some tests that, that guys should undertake as they, as they age, especially in middle age. What are some of those tests or what are some of the ones that, that, that are the must-have tests that they should be going and seeing their doctor about? So from the, from the point of view of cancer, uh, the, probably the most important one is... Uh, to get screened for bowel cancer. And the government have a screening program for men over the age of 50 where they uh, take a small sample of their stool and uh, send it off. Uh, it's a great uh, job being the person who has to uh, evaluate that, but that's all right, you know. Uh, but uh, to see whether there's any blood in the stool. And if there is blood in the stool, they need further investigations. And that really needs to be done from the age of 50 onwards. And at some point in the first five years after 50, they need a colonoscopy, just a screening colonoscopy to be able to determine if they have any polyps or abnormalities because the fecal local blood testing is not perfect. Now, if you have a family history of bowel cancer, you bring that all 10 years earlier and you do it at the age of 40, so it's earlier. And if you have a family member that has a genetic abnormality for bowel cancer, you might need to do it from the age of 20 or 25 or something like that. So you need to be aware of your family history. It's really important. The second area of screening is uh, for um, skin cancer. And from that point of view, you need to be aware uh, of any uh, particularly dark pigmented type lesions on your skin and whether they change and make sure you see your doctor about it. But it's worth getting a medical person to just look you over once a year to see if there is anything suspect. Melanoma is a big problem in Australia. Most people get cured of it, but still uh, over a 1,000 die from melanoma a year, metastatic melanoma. It's very common. We have a lot of sun. Uh, that's what causes it. Prostate cancer screening is making a comeback. It's sort of come and gone a few times. There's been a lot of controversy around prostate cancer screening, and I think a lot of that came from the fact that when it first came in, the doctors were very gung-ho about operating on everyone and, uh, you know, there were blokes having their prostates taken out that didn't need to and uh, I think they've come a long way in terms of working out people that are at risk and should have surgery and those kind of things. So I, I would recommend prostate cancer screening. I think that's really important. From the other big cancer, lung cancer, there's really not any screening techniques at the moment. It's all about prevention with lung cancer. Don't smoke. You know, that's, that's the issue. You just don't smoke. So if, if you get off cancer, you then look at, okay, what are, the, uh, what are the other important issues from a health perspective? Cardiovascular disease. So you're looking at really from the age of 40 or upwards, unless you have a family history once again, you should have your blood pressure taken once a year. You should have your cholesterol checked, and it doesn't need to be yearly at the age of 40, but you should have a baseline cholesterol. And it's cholesterol uh, is very um, genetically based. So if your parents had high cholesterol, it's very likely that you'll have it. So once again, know your family history. You need to be tested for diabetes. Diabetes is becoming increasingly 
uh, prevalent in Australia, as I said before, now a very common disease. The estimated more than one million people in Australia have diabetes now, which is largely uh, due to the obesity um, epidemic, I guess we could call it, we have in Australia. But the reality is that you, if you get that picked up early and you get treated, which is diet, exercise, reduce your weight, all of those things, most people won't need to go on medications. But it has to be picked up early, not once it started to damage organs of your body. So even those simple things uh, are really important to have screened, and certainly from the age of 40 onwards, you'd be recommending that people have at least one of that, that done at least once in that decade, and then done much more frequently if it's abnormal. That's fantastic information. And I think that's a great point you made about diabetes, is that it seems to be a, a lifestyle generated disease that, that's affected greatly by our lifestyle. Like you said, e eating healthy, exercise, um, is it true that one of the main indicators for, for increased health risk for men is the waist, the waist size? Is that an easy measure for guys to get an understanding of where they should be health-wise? Yes. Yes. So the, uh, it, it's, it seems to correlate well with um, the increased cardiovascular risk. Uh, and possibly a little bit better than BMI. Uh, so um, body mass index is a formula, and the formula is sometimes a little bit skewed depending on how tall you are and uh, things like that. So uh, overall, um, the waist measurement's an important measurement for men. And um, I, was, uh, I think the World Health Organization recommendation is, is just under 100 centimetres, or, or if you're over 100 centimetres, your health risk factors are, are greatly increased. Is that the mark? Yeah. Yeah, so if guys are heading up around the size 38, 40, 42 in the pants, they need to start doing something about their waist size. And that can be easily achieved, I know, from my experience in uh, changing your eating habits and changing your lifestyle. So, guys, get out there and uh, just get the tape measure around the waist. Um, now, you mentioned uh, regular checks for the GP. Really, the G your GP is like a trusted advisor and he's someone you should embrace in terms of, or she, um, in terms of regular checks. We should be seeing them at least once a year, maybe twice a year. What is your, even if you're feeling healthy and along the way, what's your, your, your recommendation? My recommendation is you go at least once a year if you're healthy. Uh, look, uh, it, it, it's a hackneyed analogy, but the reality is you get your, your car service regular and, you know, ho hopefully they pick things up before they, they charge you a vast quantity of money for it. But, uh, but the reality is you get checked regularly. You will pick up things at an earlier stage. And like I said before, it's not just it's not just the health issues; it's the mental health issues as well. And if you have a relationship with a GP and you know them, one, you're much more likely to open up to them and tell them things. But two, they're much more likely to notice if you're different. So if you're normally a pretty happy-go-lucky guy and you go in and you're solemn and you look really upset and things like that. You know, their job is to actually sort of try to open up a dialogue around, you know, what's going on and uh, do you have problems and issues around that. I mean, there's lots of support uh, out in the community, various different organisations that you can actually refer people to to help. But, you know, often people don't know about it and they need someone to guide them in terms of what they need to do. Okay. And how important is it for us guys to ask the, the doctor some of those questions if, if we're just not feeling right, you know, in the head, something, if, if there's something just, is it, because it, if we haven't experienced mental health issues before, they can sometimes creep up on you and really take over at a great rate if we're not aware of them. Would you say it, it's just good to just say, so explain to the doctor what you're feeling and, and what you're going through, um, if any, any abnormalities in your life or in your being? Absolutely. Often what men will do is they'll justify something. So they'll say, oh, look, it's really busy work, I'm really stressed, I can't sleep, blah, 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 whatever. So, uh, but 
you know, signs of being depressed are that your sleep's changed significantly. Things are a lot different to what they were before. Or you have incredibly morbid thoughts about things that, you know, you're going to die, your kids are going to die, something is going to occur, or, you know, and things that are out of the ordinary in your behaviour uh, may just take over. The, the, I guess the one difficulty is that sometimes it's gradual, it doesn't occur really quickly, so the men don't sometimes re- really understand it and so, uh, or, or recognise it enough. So the doctor needs to probably, will need to prompt a certain percentage of men to get those sort of things out of them. I mean, I can't tell you how many times you talk to people and you go, how are you going? Oh, I'm really good. And then you go, yeah, but how are you really going? Oh, you know, and then 12 things come out. <laughs> and you sort of go, well, you know, when you go to the doctor, you should tell them the 12 things. You don't tell them to go to the doctor to tell them you're well. <laughs> so, you know, you have to sort of open up about those things. And I think the other thing that, the other things that men should do when they go to the doctor is, firstly, they should think about that appointment, meaning they have a think about how their health's been since they were last there. So rather than how do you feel and they go, God, I feel it right now, but yesterday I was rubbish, you sort of sit there and go, yeah, no, look, I haven't been as well over the last six months or things like that. So it's almost like preparing to go rather than just turn up, I've got a pain in my left toe, that sort of thing. And I think the second thing is that they need to work with the doctor around things like, you know, when they turn 40, say to the doctor, look, what test should I have now? Because some of the GPs, you know, they get to, they're just human. They get distracted. They've had 12 really thing, bad things happen that morning. You go in. They're trying to get you out as quickly as possible. But you sit there and say, hey, hang on, just, just what things do you think I, I need to have? And then they'll sit back and go, yeah, hang on, you haven't had a health check for a while. I'll, I'll sort this out for you. And they may not do it then. They may have to get you back. But it's a two-way street. It's a partnership. And that's why I think it's really important that you have a GP you know. And I think that's a, a great thing for guys to take away is ask what tests you can have, what, uh, what screening you should have. And just because the, 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 our medical system's there to provide those tests and those screenings and, and we'd rather prevent something happening than deal with a chronic disease down the track, you know, both individually as, and as a community. Now, as, as a community, is, is there, how do we better educate men? What sort of, where can men go and, and get information and, and how can we as a community, you know, bring about better education from men from a young age and, and through the ages? I know there's a lot of stuff you're doing with Foundation 49, which is a, a men's health foundation. What else can we do? And we'll, we'll go into that a little bit details, but what else can we do as a community? I, I think, so there's multiple levels of that answer, and I'll start with the top. So from the point of view of the government, uh, the federal government brought out a male health policy uh, about five or six years ago now, um, which was a terrific document. They appointed a uh, men's health minister. They, uh, admittedly, had a few other portfolios. As soon as that government got voted out, that portfolio went, uh, and that document is uh, another white paper that's never been acted on by the government. And I think that there needs to be um, some significant proactive lobbying, both at federal and state level, around the concept of uh, reintroducing men's health ministers at, at both those levels uh, with, with uh, the idea that they're like the women's health minister and, and it's a great initiative and I'm not, not trying to take anything away from the women because they're way more proactive than us. If the women's health uh, minister had been sacked there would have been uh, an uproar like you would never it'd still be going but the men, the men's health minister went without a without a shot five I mean it was and that's pretty typical men versus women but um, you really need something coordinated from the top down because you want things embedded into school programs you want things embedded into subsequent uh, education programs like university college other things where they get messages early on. And one of the things that's really interesting to us is we've seen some uh, health programs at school where the kids will go home and talk to their father 
and say, hey, Dad, I, I think you I think you need to do something about this or go to the doctor. And often men get pushed to go to the doctor, which, you know, is another good way to, to work on them, is work on the wife and the kids. But from that point of view, I, I think the government really needs to step up and we really need to sort of stand up and say, look, it's not good enough. I, I think from the level down, it then comes down to... Um, organisations like Foundation 49, uh, Andrology Australia, and then some of the sort of more generic organisations like the Heart Foundation, the Cancer Council, all of those things, which are fantastic organisations and great organisations for a huge amount of information. The one area probably where there isn't quite as much information is about health rather than disease. And so Foundation 49 has tried to get the message across that we are promoting health not promoting the disease that they'll get. We, want, we don't want them to get the disease. And so that's where the government, once again, needs to step, step in. I mean, look, there's Big Health in um, Victoria, which does a lot of work around exercise and obesity and things like that. Uh, there's lots of things out there that people can go to to get information. You can get um, work health place programs put in place. You need a sort of a champion in your workplace to do those things. Men's sheds are good. I mean, they have... Uh, a, uh, a, a, we have links with Men's Sheds and they, they've done a lot with a lot of the other organisations and so they're good. So there are things out there. And then I guess the other thing is, and, and you always kind of harp back to it, to engage men on a, on a social big level, like population level, um, you probably have to hook things up to sport. But on a personal level, the best way to engage men is get them to go to a GP they know because the GP will know what is the latest on whatever and will be able to refer them to a specific person or a specific organisation or whatever. So that's fantastic. And um, the Foundation 49 has a great resource called the Men's Health Toolkit and I will put a link in the show notes to that. And coming up to Men's Health Week, which is in June, June 12th to 18th, the Foundation's putting on a, a business breakfast on Wednesday, June the 14th. Tell us about that and how people can get involved. Uh, to get involved, you just need to go to our website, which is uh, f49.com.au. Uh, uh, so basically what, what we try to do at the breakfast is uh, engage... Um, groups of men that are around that sort of 40 to 55 age group that are working uh, to give them a health message that they can take back to their own organisation. And so we welcome anyone to come to the breakfast. What usually happens is that we have uh, an incredibly boring speech by me that only goes for a few minutes, thank God. Uh, and then we have a far better speaker than me that goes for significantly longer that will talk about a cogent issue around, uh, around men's health at the time. For example, uh, last year we had um, Peter Brookner, who is the Olympic uh, doctor, and he was talking about obesity and diabetes and uh, uh, he was uh, terrific. He showed us 5,000 photos of himself with every athlete that had been in Australia. But um, but, but but he did gave a great talk, and it was and a lot of men went away. And you can always tell by these breakfasts whether people stay to the end, or they nick off uh, half an hour early. And secondly, whether they come up and ask you questions. And uh, it, we always get people staying to the end and a lot of questions because we try to pick a topic that's very important. And what it does is it opens people up to our organisation so they can go to our website, they uh, get a bit more understanding of what we do and uh, some of the organisations we work with as well. Uh, yeah, and I'll certainly be there and I think it's a great event. And being a business breakfast, it, it, it throws me onto an idea that I've been talking to a, a number of business people who have implemented health and fitness programs into their workplace or have encouraged their staff to get involved in health and fitness by paying for their gym memberships, etc. And their feedback to me is that it has actually revolutionised their business. They've got a, a healthier, fitter workforce and their productivity 
has just lifted. So business is probably a, a place we can start. Is that something you'd, you'd encourage, especially people if they're coming to the business breakfast, to take that message back to their business? Oh, no, absolutely. We've been doing that for quite a few years. We've done quite a few uh, corporate events where we will go, and there's actually figures to show that if you keep your staff fit and healthy, that your productivity is significantly better uh, than, uh, than if you don't. And you also have greater retention rate of staff, greater loyalty, and um, so there's no downside to doing it. I mean, one of the, one of the, I guess one of the big issues around all of those programs in companies is uh, the companies are all for them in the good times, uh, but what they have to realise is if the, uh, you know, the next GFC occurs or something, that's something that will help them through it rather than just cut the top 10% off and take all those things out. So, and that's sort of how things tend to work in the economic cycle, that uh, a lot of those programs become popular during that, but they, they're the first to get axed when, uh, when the, the economy starts going south. So it, it has to be something that almost is embedded into the organisation, so at every level. And I think if business owners and leaders look at it as a return on investment, which is the bottom line, if their, peop if their people are, are fit and healthy and more productive, then their bottom line should look good. Um, Gary, thanks for your time today. I think it's a great lead into Men's Health Week. And I think it should, men shouldn't just focus on their health just for one week, but at least it's a great week to highlight it. Um, looking forward to the Foundation 49 Business Breakfast, and I'll put links into the show notes uh, for men to get on board. I think uh, you and the Foundation and what you're doing is, is great, and hopefully we can prevent men from coming to see you professionally. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Thanks for your time. No worries. Cheers. Thank you for listening to The Transformed Man Show. For more great information, please go to transformedmanshow.com.